First, point of information. When you talk about the gang in Washington, you need to make it clear, hopefully, that you don't mean only the present gang. You mean from at least 2008 forward, right? Yeah, I mean the whole Washington Be foreign before policy this regime establishment. And, right. Republicans, Democrats. As far as I'm concerned, the Republicans and the Democrats on foreign policy are like Tweedledee and Tweedledum. <laughs> Right, right, I mean, right, for anybody exactly. who thinks it matters whether you get Hillary Clinton or some Republican, you're living in a dream world. There's just no meaningful difference between them. They both have the Midas touch in reverse. So that leads to my second question. Is anybody listening to you and Stephen Cohen and partial, um, what's the one I want? Uh, the Kissinger, partial Kissinger, Stephen Cohen and you. Is anybody listening? that we could hope to vote for or support. No. I don't, I don't, no, 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 no one, no one. So, and no. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give this up in a moment. No. But, um, so there's no one, so we're really doomed. That's it, right? Okay. I mean, th there's no enlightenment in store. We I can't just, even can look I just, to Can I just mind. say something, just in response to your question? I, I believe that since 1989, the United States has been by far the most powerful state on the planet. And for those of you who believe we live in a unipolar world, you're effectively saying that we are the only great power in the system. And given that tremendous amount of power that we have, we're really free to go out and do all sorts of foolish things because it doesn't blow back on us in any meaningful way. The United States is a remarkably secure great power. So we're allowed to pursue these foolish policies. And in that context, it's very hard to make arguments against the establishment that carry the day. I think what will happen if China continues to rise is that it will force the United States to think more strategically. Because when you live in a serious threat environment, the point I'm making to you is that the United States does not live in a serious threat environment. We're an incredibly secure country. We're the most secure country, most secure great power in the history of the world, and we're more secure today than we have ever been in our entire history. Despite all the, the rhetoric that you hear from Washington and in the media about how dangerous the world is, this is just not a serious argument. It's not a dangerous world, right? We are incredibly secure. We have a peer competitor. It'll force us to focus the mind, much the way it uh, happened when the Soviet Union was there, Nazi Germany was there, Imperial Japan, Imperial Germany. Really enjoyed your lecture. I have two questions briefly. Uh, it's hard to take issue with the goal of a neutral Ukraine, but some years before the crisis broke out, I used to listen to RUI, which was Radio Ukraine International on shortwave. And they were fairly open about the cultural crisis within the country leading back a few years before this. As I look at, say, the former Czechoslovakia, do you see a possibility of two neutral states formerly known as Ukraine as non-viable? And if so, why? Yeah, uh, if you look at what happened in Europe after World War II, Yugoslavia broke up into a series of remnant states. Czechoslovakia, as you pointed out, broke up into a series of remnant states. And the Soviet Union itself broke up into a series of remnant states. And that's because inside of those territorial boundaries, you had different nations that wanted their own states. Serbs, Croats, in the case of Yugoslavia, Czechs, Slovaks, in the case of Czechoslovakia. And we know that there were probably 15 or 16 different groups inside of the former Soviet Union. So the question is, inside Ukraine, do you have a similar situation between the people in the East and the people in the West? I think if you look at the survey data, it still shows that the, major, the clear majority of Ukrainians in both the West and the East want to maintain the integrity of Ukraine. They don't want to split Ukraine in half. Uh, I think we should do everything we can to maintain that attitude among the Ukrainian people. My great fear is that as time goes by and the animosity continues to grow, 
that you may reach a point where there is a lot of sentiment to just break Eastern Ukraine and Western Ukraine off from each other and end up with two Ukraines. But I don't see that happening now. Second and final question. As we look at parts of our recent additions to NATO, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and look at where their political systems are careening, has NATO lost the moral imperative for its reason to being? Well, I mean, what we tried to do with NATO expansion uh, and with EU expansion and with democracy promotion was to turn all of Europe into one giant security community in which all of the member states were liberal democracies that were hooked on capitalism and deeply embedded in these institutions and would therefore obey the rules that define the institution and we would all live happily ever after. That was the goal. And I think everybody understood that Western Europe looked terrific on all of those dimensions. And what we were gonna try and do is expand, extend these institutions eastward and consolidate democracy in countries like Hungary and Poland, and we were gonna make them look more like Western Europe over time. Uh, we had some success and there's some failures. And if you talk to most people who study Europe today and spend lots of time over there, uh, they're quite pessimistic about where Europe is headed, not only regarding Eastern Europe, but also with regard to Western Europe. Uh, and I'm not sure in you know, 25 years what it'll all look like. Uh, I mean, in my opinion, the biggest issue is demographic, and that is that the Europeans have not been making lots of babies for a long time, and as a result, they're gonna have to import lots of people. And these are countries that do not have a rich history of integrating people uh, in a smooth way, much the way the United States does. Uh, and it's no accident, I think, that you're now beginning to see the rise of far-right parties all across Europe because of all of uh, the immigration. So one could paint a pretty bleak picture about Europe's future, but the counter to that would be, we've now got all those countries, like Romania, right, like the Czech Republic, like Slovakia, embedded in these institutions, and these institutions will go to great lengths to combat those tendencies, and in maybe a more incremental way, uh, facilitate the spread of liberal democracy and capitalism. We'll see whether that happens or not. But people today are nowhere near as optimistic as they were in the early 1990s when it looked like we had the wind at our back and uh, everything was gonna play out over time uh, in favor of the West and especially in favor of the United States. You all remember Frank Fukuyama's very famous piece, The End of History. Right, which I think reflected that optimism uh, uh, when the Soviet Union was uh, losing the Cold War and about to collapse. Uh, but times have changed. Okay. Uh, you said, quote, we're gonna have our hands full with China. And so just two questions. What kind of a time frame are you thinking things might start to really happen in that direction? And can you just paint a few scenarios of the sort of things that you think might happen when we have our hands full with China so we know what, what we can look forward to? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think when you think about China at this point in time, there are three uh, situations that stand out. One is Taiwan. Two is the South China Sea, which has been in the newspaper uh, a great deal over the past few months. Chinese basically claim that they control all the South China Sea, and as you know, they're building airfields on reefs uh, in the Spratly Islands, and we've told them that's unacceptable, and their neighbors, the Vietnamese, the Philippines, think that's unacceptable. So the South China Sea is a potential flashpoint. Taiwan is a second flashpoint, 
And the third flashpoint, which was in the news earlier this year and for much of 2013 and 2014, are those rocks in the East China Sea. Uh, the Japanese call them the Senkaku Islands, the Chinese call them the Diao Islands. Uh, and uh, as I was saying to you folks before I was in Japan in December of last year, December 2014, and it's really quite amazing how worried the Japanese are about China. Uh, and part of it is sort of for realpolitik reasons, but it's also because the Chinese say those islands, which the Japanese consider to be sacred territory, really belong to China. And uh, the Japanese are greatly fearful that as China gets more powerful, it'll take those islands. Uh, so those are the three main flashpoints at the time. There are other possible scenarios that we worry about. The Korean Peninsula is one because the Chinese are allied with the North Koreans, we're allowed, allied with the South Koreans. Um, China and India, they have a border conflict, so we go on and on. But those are the big three. Now, your question about the time frame is an excellent one. I used to say that it'll take another 10, 15 years before China becomes powerful enough uh, for this problem to manifest itself. I'm not sure about that. I think it's, it, it's possible. It's not likely. I'm choosing my words carefully. I think it's possible that you could have a conflict involving the United States and China over the South China Sea uh, or over the Senkaku slash Diao Islands uh, in the next year or so. Uh, I mean, those, those problems are on the front burner. And it's basically a zero-sum game. I mean, either the Chinese own the Senkaku Diao Islands or the Japanese do. Uh, so we could have trouble out there m much sooner than I uh, have anticipated up to now. You talked about this from the point of view of a logical uh, international relations. Uh, what do you think of the internal pressures on these countries? Putin has a historically restive population, highly nationalistic, and in major economic troubles now, uh, he may be responding to pressure from his own population to deal with this. On a smaller scale, we see Netanyahu uh, responding to his population, settlers and so on, and disrupting part of the Middle East. Do you see that happening here? with the radical right, say, and the neocons uh, influencing uh, Washington policy? Uh, I think just with regard to the United States and the neoconservatives, uh, I think the neoconservatives uh, have been one of the principal driving forces behind America's foolish foreign policy uh, since 2001. But uh, as I made, as I said before, when I was talking about the Republican Party looking like the Democratic Party, uh, there's not a lot of difference between the neoconservatives and the liberal imperialists. Uh, the liberal imperialists are the uh, aggressively oriented Democrats, and the neoconservatives are the aggressively oriented Republicans. Uh, but they look a lot like Tweedledee and Tweedledum. So the neoconservatives matter for sure, and they mattered during the George W. Bush administration because he was a Republican president. But it's not just the neoconservatives, right? And the fact is that you have a foreign policy establishment here uh, that is interested in intervening all over the world. You have a foreign policy establishment that's filled with people who believe that we have a right and a responsibility to intervene all over the planet. And that leads to unending trouble when you don't have the magic formula for winning the wars that you get into. See, the problem that we have is we have this interventionist foreign policy that leads to us losing all the time. It's really quite remarkable. Um, but, uh, but just with regard to your point about ideology, uh, I think you do not want to underestimate how important nationalism is both in the Chinese context and in the Russian context. You were alluding to the Russian case, but let me just say a few words about the Chinese case. Uh, and this is why, getting back to this gentleman's previous question, uh, I worry so much now about uh, Japan and China getting into a shooting war over the 
rocks in the East China Sea. It, the problem that the Chinese face is that communism, which is the governing ideology, no longer has much legitimacy. And they've had to find a substitute ideology. And by almost all accounts, the substitute ideology is nationalism. Right? And at the core of Chinese nationalism is what's known as the century of national humiliation. Uh, Chinese nationalism emphasizes that between roughly 1850 and 1950, that 100 year period, China was humiliated. And it was humiliated by the European great powers, the United States with the open door policy, and especially by Japan. And the Chinese are really just angry about this. And because nationalism is so important for legitimizing the rulers in Beijing, right, uh, this whole theme of national humiliation is front and center. Well, if you have a crisis over some islands in the East China Sea, and that crisis involves Japan mainly, but also the United States, and you're talking about the two countries that have humiliated China during that 100 year period, the potential for trouble is great. And I know a number of scholars in China who are quite dovish, who really worry about a crisis in the East China Sea spinning out of control because of the confluence of Chinese nationalism and Japanese nationalism, which I've not talked about. So nationalism is a very powerful force, not just in the Russian case, but in the Chinese slash Japanese case as well. Hi, I'm uh, Adam Chekhov. Actually, I just graduated last year. And Could you uh, talk a little louder? Sorry. Hi, I'm Adam Chekhov. I graduated last year also. Thank you for signing the piece of paper that allowed for Molly Wen to exist as someone who participated in MUN for all four years. But uh, uh, two questions. One, uh, this is pretty quick. You talked about like Russia offered Ukraine a deal involving uh, Russia, the EU, the IMF, uh, Ukraine. Can you like lay out the specific terms of that deal and... In 2013. Yeah, in 2013 uh, 13 when, when they offered them the deal. And two, this is a little more in-depth. What, what's the first question, though? What are the terms of the deal, exactly? Uh, I'm not the sure. terms of the deal, Russia... Uh, Russia you want me to outline Ukraine. the terms of the deal? Yes, if you... if I, I don't know, I honestly don't know what the terms of the deal were. Okay, well, then we'll just skip that one. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, I guess the impression that I've had is that like, you do have several... Well, certainly the, the U.S. is trying to back Russia into a corner. You do have several like uh, people in Germany, like I, especially uh, mostly in Merkel's uh, coalition uh, partner of the SPD, like uh, in, uh, in their cabinet, uh, I think Zygmunt Gabriel is one who is pushing for like a more diplomatic solution towards the Ukraine crisis. So in the long term, can you see like potentially Germany, which is at this point Europe's one of their most powerful states, potentially like serving in this crisis, metaphorically speaking, as the... Yeah sort of the good cop to U.S.'s bad cop, so yeah. to speak? Yeah, this is, this is a great question. Uh, as you all know, Germany is the most powerful country in Europe. Uh, and uh, I showed you the map where I told you that Germany and Russia were of enormous importance for thinking about Ukraine. So the question is, how do the Germans think about this? Initially, when the crisis first began, after the February 22nd coup, I thought the Germans would prevail on the Americans to behave smartly and to slowly but steadily just back off and work out some sort of deal. Very importantly, you remember I told you about the famous April 2008 Bucharest conference, and I told you what was said in the final declaration that Ukraine and Georgia would become part of NATO? Very important to understand that the reason that we did not take concrete steps during the Bucharest crisis to move to include Ukraine and Georgia was because of German and French, but mainly German resistance. Angela Merkel. Angela Merkel said, bringing Ukraine and Georgia into NATO is a prescription for disaster. The United States, though, prevailed on getting that statement in the final declaration that I read to you. 
So based on that, I thought the Germans would play a key role in tamping down American enthusiasm for doubling down. I proved to be wrong. And uh, if anything, Angela Merkel has been a bit more aggressive towards um, the Russians than President Obama has. It's really quite striking. And therefore, I don't hold out much hope for the Germans. One final point I would make about this, I've actually spoken on this subject in Germany. In early March, I was in Germany. I was in Frankfurt, and then I was in Berlin talking to different groups. And my view of the Germans is that as a consequence of World War II, the Germans don't want to be out front on any issue. The Germans, to put it rather crudely, are afraid to look at themselves in the mirror, right? And the idea of them taking the lead, it horrifies them across the entire political spectrum. So my message to the Germans when I talked to them was they should be more bullshit when they talk to the Americans. They should tell the Americans more emphatically that they're wrong and we should be doing this instead of that. And uh, that line of argument gets remarkably little traction because, again, the Germans just, um, they don't want to get too far out front on this. So I don't see much hope uh, that uh, things will change. Final point I'd make on this, what I find very striking about this whole uh, situation, uh, as I was saying before, I think you know, Steve Cohen, Henry Kissinger, me, and there are a handful of other people, my friend Steve Walt, who've kind of been arguing the position that I laid out for you here today, but we are definitely in the minority. Uh, a tiny minority. And uh, what I find very interesting is the extent to which the media here and the media in Europe parrot the conventional wisdom and the extent to which it's very difficult for people who represent the position I've staked out to be heard, right? So in Europe, you have this situation, and it's especially true in Germany. I don't read German, but just talking to people when I was there about you know, how the media is dealing with this, the conventional wisdom that I laid out for you is uh, omnipresent in the media. And, uh, and that makes it very hard to turn this one around. Uh, so I'm not optimistic uh, that there's any chance this is going to uh, change, our policy is going to change, which I think is a tragedy, as I said before. And also, it contradicts my earlier enthusiasm about Angela Merkel, which is what you were getting at. Bob. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Nell Smith, uh, class of 85, college. Hey, Julius. See you later. Um, <laughs> um, about the Bucharest directly, I have a friend that was teaching in Russia this summer and said that people were just, and for those, I speak Russian and have been to Soviet Union in, and, and then post, I mean, suddenly it's not, you're no longer a rock star now, apparently, if you're American and you're on the streets of Moscow, like we, we're used to people my age. Um, she said people were coming up to her saying, what are you doing? Why you and the Germans have caused all of this? You got all these rebels in Ukraine, you, you, know, you organized them secretly in Kiev, and it was kind of, but now listening to you, it's like, that's actually not that far off, it sounds like. I mean, not, we didn't organize them, but basically we kind of told them, yeah, go ahead, because we're gonna help you, right? Is that, yeah. okay. Well, let, let me make a couple points, very important points. With regard to my response to the gentleman who's directly behind you about nationalism, this is Russian nationalism coming to the fore. And a lot of what you see in the American case is American nationalism coming to the fore. You've all heard the famous saying or infamous saying, my country, right or wrong, right? And uh, uh, there are just all sorts of Russians you know, who are furious at the West and they're rallying around Putin. One of the reasons that many people think that Putin started this whole thing uh, was because uh, 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 it, it so improved his standings in the polls or with the Russian public because people behaved the way you said. So people said he started this crisis for that reason. But my point to you is we should be hardly surprised. And this gets back to the China-Japan example. 
you know, and this is a very scary dimension to a lot of these conflicts. But I just want to say one other thing. Uh, I teach, I've done all the research for a book on the German killing machine in World War II. I know a great deal about who the Germans killed, how they killed them, and so forth and so on. Uh, some of you here have probably taken my course, War on the Nation State, where I talk about the origins of the Holocaust, the origins of the war on the Eastern Front, killing of Soviet POWs, and so forth and so on. But my estimate is that Hitler murdered, this is not killed in combat, Hitler murdered 22 million people. Uh, and if you look at how that war played itself out in places like Ukraine, uh, uh, there were people in Ukraine who sided with the Germans, and the vast majority of people, of course, fought against the Germans. Um, but the consequences of that war are inextricably bound up with what's going on now. And the mere fact that there are, you know, some reasonably small number, but nevertheless, some fascists, real fascists, involved in Kiev just spooks the Russians like you would not believe, right? And a lot of those fascists and people on the far right hate the Soviet Union for all the obvious reasons. See, the Soviet Union slash Russia is largely responsible for all the killings that took place in Ukraine on the part of the Soviet Union, not the Germans, right? War history coming in. So what's going on inside Ukraine is inextricably bound up with World War II. And then the point that I tried to make to you, although I didn't develop it at length, is that NATO, which is a Cold War institution, right, is inextricably bound up with the Cold War. And from a Russian point of view, this military alliance moving up to its doorstep, which was a mortal foe for 45 years, is gonna spook you. And if you have a coup in Kiev, and some of the people who come to power have fascist tendencies or are fascist, however you want to find that term, it's going to have really huge consequences, right? So this is, this is an incredibly messy situation. And in the context of all this, what we've done is doubled down. And we do not pay much attention to history because it was not a history that concerned us in any meaningful way because it was on the eastern half of the European continent. But uh, the potential for trouble here is just very, very great. Should I, one more? No more. I can't take any more questions, so you'll have to ask me afterwards. I'll answer your question afterwards. Mike told me that. <laughs>